All right, so welcome everyone to this talk uh, number four in the series of uh, the one pass on quantum PDs. And it's a pleasure to have uh, today Michael Loss from Georgia Tech, who's going to talk to us about symmetry and symmetry breaking in functional inequalities. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much, uh, Benoit and uh, Ian, for the invitation. And uh, so, so symmetry and symmetry breaking in functional inequalities is sort of a topic which I've been working on and off with my good friends. Uh, these are, let's see whether I can manage them. Yeah, Jean Dolbeau, Marie Esteban, and also with Rupert Frank from Caltech. Jean and Maria in France at Cerimat. So uh, what is the, it, it, I would say I start first with a lament. So we're talking about a, a quantum particle interacting with the magnetic field. And you know very well that we have to replace minus I grad by minus I grad minus the vector potential where the curl of this vector potential is the given magnetic field. And of course, this, this gadget here has a certain invariance, which is called the gauge invariance that causes some of the problems. In other words, when you go and you change the psi by a phase, the phi is definitely a function here, and you change the a by a, a plus grad phi, right? Remember psi is a complex function. Then uh, this magnitude of minus i grad minus a psi is invariant, yeah? So this is, what we call gauge invariant, gauge invariance. So the, 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 the problem, I mean, let me, let me start with a few examples of questions which you would like to have answered, which there aren't really any much answers to it. So here, the first thing is the problem is complicated, right? And we already see this in the lambda Hamiltonian in two dimensions with the constant magnetic field. I mean, you would think this cannot be any more simple than that. And it turns out the eigenvalues, this is a linear problem. The eigenvalues are infinitely degenerate. They're called the lambda level, levels. And the ground state is not necessarily positive nor real, radial, right? Because it's infinitely degenerate. And so, so my general questions about magnetic fields is, well, can you say anything about symmetries of energy minimizers for systems with magnetic fields? Okay, so that's sort of a, a very vague and, and, and general question. And I, I supply some examples. Uh, one of the first ones, and I think that's a fairly very deep statement, is by Avron Herbst and Simon, goes back in 1980 to 1981. And what you do is you take um, a hydrogen atom in a constant magnetic field, and you, you point the magnetic field along the z-axis, right? So, so the Hamiltonian, I've written it here, it's a third line. This is your Hamiltonian, you look for the ground state wave function. And what they prove actually that the ground state function is what you expect it is namely only a function of x squared plus y squared square root and z, okay? So it, in some sense, you have this, this axial symmetry of the hydrogen atom. The proof is very tricky and very, very involved. It's, I think this is a deep result. It's not non-trivial at all. Another example where we have some positive results is, is, is Rayleigh's, Rayleigh's conjecture with constant magnetic field. Maybe you remember Rayleigh's conjecture is that when you look at the drum and you look at the lowest um, frequency of the drum and you ask yourself, well, keeping the area of the drum fixed, what should be the geometric shape of the drum to have the lowest value for, of the frequency? Then it turns out that this drum should be a disc. And now Laszlo Erdős in 1996 asked the same question for uh, um, the Dirichlet problem, but with a constant magnetic field. So it's a two dimensional problem, right? Uh, you, you look at the lambda Hamiltonian in this two dimensional problem, the, the lowest eigenvalue. You assume that psi vanishes is on the boundary and you ask yourself, well, how do you have to change the shape of omega but keeping the area fixed so that the eigenvalue is a small as possible. And indeed, it turns out when omega is equals omega star is a disk of the same area as omega, then indeed, the eigenvalue is lowest. Uh, now, let's go on to another problem. I mean, there are a number of, of, of very simple variational problems like this one here. So, so, so 
suppose the, the magnetic field A is zero and you ask yourself, well, how do I minimize? It is the minimizer of this ratio um, radial? And the answer is true, yes, of course. And this is an immediate consequence of what is called the rearrangement inequality. You turn on the magnetic field and here A is the vector potential of a constant magnetic field. So it's again, two dimensional. The magnetic field points in the Z direction. Well, is you would expect that the minimizer of this problem is radially symmetric about some point. And oddly enough, yes, it's true, but only for very small magnetic fields. This is a result by Bonner, Nies, and Van Schaftingen, goes back to 2019, relatively recent. And uh, interestingly enough, this is only perturbative result. They use implicit function theorems, so there's no control on how big the magnetic field should be. But you know, if you ask any physicist, I would say they would expect that the minimizer should be about some point radial, right? Because the problem is translation invariant and rotation invariant, okay? So I, 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 for this problem, I would very much like to solve such a problem, but I cannot do it. So what one does is, of course, you do what you can, right? And you come up with some other examples, right? We search for other nonlinear examples. And let me also point out, there are some standard techniques, right? Rearrangements, moving planes, all these things don't seem to work, right? And the reason I think is because the Euler-Lagrange equations are really not just a PDE for a single function, but it's actually a system of PDEs. And, and so, and also I should also say, maybe one should not be overly enthusiastic because absence of symmetry of the minimizers is very often the typical situation. But still, for these problems I just mentioned, I would ex strongly expect this is true. And, and as we know, for very small magnetic fields, in fact, in fact it is. So, so I, I, I search for other nonlinear examples, and here is one, uh, which you know we thought would be reasonably simple. Namely, we take the what is called now the Haran of Bohm field in two dimensions. So you imagine you have a solenoid, sort of a delta function for a, a magnetic field at the origin, and that generates a vector potential. Now, this problem actually was already investigated 10 years before Arnon of Bohm by Ehrenberg Sidai. And the issue there was uh, that one always believes that what is physical is the magnetic field and not the A potential. And nowadays you see experiments with solenoids where the, where the particle in some sense does ne never sees the field, it's far away, but still it experiences some phase shifts due to the vector potential A, the so-called unphysical vector potential. But anyway, this is not what I would like, uh, I'm gonna investigate here. Uh, uh, first, so from the calculus of variations point of view is an interesting statement and very simple actually, is a magnetic hard inequality. This was an observation by Laptev and Weidel in 1998, I think. And it's the following. You have a hard inequality, it's written down here which you can see here, right? And, and you see what is interesting about it is if the alpha here is zero, yeah, I should say the beta is just the nearest distance of alpha to the integers, right? So you see when the alpha is equal to zero, then this, this, this hard inequality is in fact wrong, right? Because you see in order to have the right hand side finite, you need that the psi somehow vanishes at the origin, but you know, when you don't have the alpha, there's no guarantee that the psi, I mean, the psi doesn't have to vanish at the origin, okay? So this is false when alpha is equal to zero, but when alpha is not equal to zero, it's true. And here is this inequality. This is, uh, it's very easy to prove and, and um, but still it's, it's, it's an interesting statement because it some, some sense tells you that there are a few things to be investigated here. Uh, what we do from now on is we always assume that the alpha is now a number because the beta is always between zero and one half. So we're gonna assume also that the alpha is gonna be between zero and one half to make our life easy. You can always, you see this K comes in because you can always make a gauge transformation to shift the phase, right? Okay. So this is this, this hard inequality of, of Laptev and Weidel. And what uh, we thought was let's, 
in, investigate a, an interpolation inequality, namely the one which I've seen before, except you put in some weights. So here is the kinetic energy, we're in two dimensions, right? This is your, 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 your kinetic energy of your electron on the plane. The AS is precisely this Aronoff Bohm field. Remember the alpha is between zero and one half. And then we add a few terms, lambda times the integral of modulus of psi squared over x squared plus y squared and likewise down here. Okay, so, so psi is a complex valued function. And what we would like to understand is what can you say about the optimizers of this function, right? Okay, so, so uh, the, these weights here we put in because of scaling, but there is also another reason and let me explain why it is weights. You see, suppose you, you only look at the problem without the weights. So you have the altunum of psi squared uh, of psi, the alpinum of psi. Then of course, you can apply what is called the diamagnetic inequality, right? What is it? You write the, the psi, its modulus as u, the psi itself as a phase times u, and then you learn that the kinetic energy can be split as gradient u squared plus a term which depends entirely on the phase and the magnetic field. So now what you can do is you can, sorry, I have to, I get always this news here. You can simply drop this term with the magnetic field and you get a lower bound. Here it is, yeah. By the way, do you see my pointer when you move it? Yes. Anyone? yes. Yeah, good. So, so you, you get a lower bound, right? And this lower bound is actually sharp, why? Because you see, you can move the, the, the psi out to infinity and because this term decays, you just don't see it. So in other words, this problem here doesn't even have a chance of having an optimizer, right? Okay, so this is the reason why we go back and put in these weights because that precludes this simple, simple minded idea that you shove out the psi to out to infinity, okay? And, and decrease the energy, all right? So this is the problem. And what are the results? Well, here's a theorem by Denis Bonner, Mar Jean Delbourg, Maria Esteban, Ari Laptev and myself. We sort of all collaborated on this. So, so this is a little bit strange, right? I mean, again, let me, let me go back. You have two parameters, right? You have uh, actually three, you have the P, which we assume, of course, to be a number bigger than two. Secondly, you have the alpha. This is a number between zero and one half. And then you have the, what else? The lambda here, right? These are these three parameters. And depending on these parameters, you have symmetry or not. So if the lambda is less or equals this quantity here, notice you have a one minus four alpha squared minus alpha squared here. I call this function here lambda star. When the lambda is less or equals this right hand side and strictly bigger than minus alpha squared, then, I mean, first of all, you have an optimizer, right, under this condition. And secondly, when this condition is satisfied for lambda, then the minimizers are given up to a constant scaling by this function here. And zeta is this number. So, so this is kind of natural, you would think, yeah, I mean, well, natural and not natural, but the proof is difficult in a way. But uh, what you notice is that this is a function not only vanishing at infinity, but it also vanishes at the origin as it should be. And it vanishes in a certain fashion, right? Okay. So, so this lambda has to be small. And by the way, I always assume that the alpha is strictly less than one half because you see here when alpha is equals one half, this term here disappears. And then you have minus alpha squared here, minus alpha squared here, but you here you need a strict inequality. So that precludes the alpha to be ever one half. Okay, good. So this is the, the result. This looks actually pretty good, but of course the next question is what happens when lambda is bigger than this lambda star? Okay, and then things look a little bit worse because we cannot really say anything about that, but we have found a trial function this lives, lives, gives you a certain function lambda bullet. That's this complicated expression. 
And whenever the lambda is strictly bigger than lambda bullet, we know that the minimize is no longer radially symmetric. Right? It, it's, it, it picks up angular dependence and it, I don't know how it looks like. It's, it's fairly open. What is remarkable actually that is this lambda bullet here and the lambda star, which we had before, these, these two numbers or functions, I should say, are, are very close. They, are, they, they differ less than 1% uniformly in P and alpha, okay? So this is this result, right? And of course, the, the, the lambda bullet is of course strictly bigger than lambda star, right? So, so in between, we have a little region where we have no clue what's going on, okay? So now what I would like to, to, to tell you a little bit is give you a little bit ideas how one can prove such a result, right? I mean, it's remarkable that you have a magnetic field and nevertheless, the ground state is essentially non-degenerate and positive, right? I mean, you can, you can multiply by a constant and you can scale it, but that's about, that's it. You cannot do more under this condition here, okay? So, so now let's, uh, uh, here's another uh, point which you would like to make, namely when alpha is equal to zero, you already have a non-trivial result. This time the lambda star is equals lambda bullet, it's that, and the minimizer of that functional is given by this function, as you would expect, right? Provided, of course, that lambda is less or equals four over p squared minus four. And when it's bigger than that number, it turns out the minimizer is not radial anymore, okay? So it's a special case. Good. So now what I would like to do is give you a little bit of a hint uh, how to prove it. Yeah, uh, one remark. Um, so, so, so what are the implications of that, right? So when the lambda is less than lambda star, as I said, this, the, the minimize is symmetric and essentially unique. When lambda is bigger lambda bullet, the minimize is no longer unique and it turns out then, of course, that the Euler-Lagrange equations have infinitely many solutions. There is the non-minimizing symmetric solution. That's still a solution of the Euler-Lagrange equation, but it's not minimizing anymore. And you have an infinite set of minimizing solutions, which are not radial, because you see, you can still rotate them and you get a whole family, yeah? However, absolutely nothing is, is known about these non-symmetric solutions, okay? So now let me, give you an application, a little application, what one can uh, you know, solve with such a problem. I mean, suppose you're interested in this problem here, integral R over R2, here's the kinetic energy, and you subtract the potential, right? This is sort of a classic problem in, in, in Schrodinger operators. And what we do, however, is because of scaling, we minimize this function over all functions whose psi squared divided by x squared is normalized, okay? Now, when you minimize under this constraint, you get an eigenvalue. And there is uh, the natural norm on the potential is given by this quantity here, all right? You see, you have to take care of these factors one over x squared. And the, the, the natural uh, uh, number related to this potential is this number. When you are usually in, on the real line, then of course you don't have to put any weights and then you can forget about these weights down here, but we are not really on the real line, we are in R2. Okay, good. So now here's the question. Well, can you get an estimate on the lowest eigenvalue, right? This is the ground state. This is in general a negative eigenvalue. And the answer is yes. You can show there is a monotone increasing convex function. What is this convex function? Remember, I set here, put here a mu of lambda. The mu of lambda is the sharp constant in this inequality when you minimize, right? And that's of course a function of lambda. And you can easily see that it's a concave function, obviously, because you minimize over linear functions in lambda, so it's concave. And now you look at the inverse function of that one. Where am I? Here, right? Okay, so that's this lambda of mu. Uh, you know that when the mu goes to zero, that the lambda converges to that number. And you know that the lowest eigenvalue of this operator is always bounded below by this function evaluated 
at the strange norm of the potential. Now, when the alpha is now in the interval 0, 1 half, there exists a mu star such that whenever the norm of this potential is less than mu star, then there's equality here if and only if the potential is of this form. Right? I mean, this is precisely the analogous statement of a result which goes back to Rees, Nudge, Joe Keller, Lieben, Turing about the one dimensional problem where they established a similar result. Of course, there it's considerably easier than here in the two dimensional case. Okay? So this is a, a very simple application. It's not very hard to prove, I'm not going to do it, of this uh, result here, all right, of this theorem. Okay, so you see, this is in some sense precisely the reason why one often investigates nonlinear functionals of this type. Let me go back and show it to you of such kind of functionals, right? They're quite useful. And it's quite useful to understand them in depth, how they look like and what the minimizers are. Okay, good. So now let's go on. And what I would like to tell you is a little bit how you prove that, right? Namely, the, so I don't know how to deal with complex functions. That's always too difficult. So there, what you need is you use, you use a basic reduction lemma. Again, I'm not gonna prove it. And that's the following. And, and now notice, I'm only talking about angles here. Hmm? So uh, alpha is a constant, of course. So you have the derivative of psi minus i alpha psi, modulus squared, and you integrate it over the normalized uh, uh, circular measure, right? Over the, sphere, over the circle. And what you can prove is, and that's, it's not very difficult. Well, it's not so easy either, but it's okay, moderately difficult, is the following lower bound. You get this one minus four alpha squared times the derivative. And here you have the derivative of the modulus. So this almost looks like a little bit of a diamagnetic inequality plus alpha squared times integral modulus of psi squared, okay? And this inequality is sharp. You can saturate it actually with functions psi, which are constant, right? Then you can saturate it. Okay. So, so let's just accept this uh, basic reduction lemma. I'm not going to prove it. And then the rest is actually pretty straightforward. Well, what do you do? You, you, you take your kinetic energy and turn it into polar coordinates, right? So I've written it here in the second line. This is polar coordinates. And you see, this is, of course, precisely the term which shows up in this basic reduction lemma. OK. So, so you use that lemma, and what you get is a lower bound on your functional, which looks now pretty crazy, right? Well, you have an alpha squared plus lambda, that's clear, right? Because from the, from the reduction lemma, you have this alpha squared. Then you get a one minus four alpha squared divided by r squared times the derivative of v in theta. That's also clear because that's the, sorry, that's the first term here. All right, and then, you, you, you get the derivative of V just with respect to R, right? And remember what is V? V is the modulus of Psi. And what I did here, I, I, I committed a little bit of a crime, namely the Psi, remember, is a complex function. But what I did is I dropped the derivative of the phase because that makes a positive contribution, okay? So this is an, an, an easy inequality here, all right. So this is your, 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 your lower bound. And now you have this very strange functional where you have here that there are radial derivative, but the angular derivative has this odd factor less than one in front of it, okay? So then how do you deal with it? Well, you try to relate it to something which you remember and you make a very simple very, um, variable substitution. You write the V as a U of R to the theta R to the delta where the eta is square root of one minus four alpha squared and the delta is square root of lambda plus uh, uh, alpha squared, okay? And when you do that, the function is transformed to this ratio. You can ignore this factor. I mean, it's important, of course, for the constant. And here, the A is a negative number, namely this one, and the B is given by this equation and this two over p, of course, is less than one. This is a, 
a weighted Sobolev inequality. And this is also known as a special case of the caffarelli cohn nirnberg inequalities. And I will mention a few things about those, okay? So here you are. So in other words, minimizing this problem, you see, you might say, well, if I minimize this and I figure out that the functions are radial, why does this tell me anything about our original problem? Where is it? Here, right? And of course it does. Why? Because you see this clearly in the radial case when you go to the to here. Because when it's radial, first of all, you drop the, fa the phase. The V is radial, so the derivatives here all disappear. And what you see here, this reduction lemma is actually sharp. So you have a very good, I mean, it, provided you can establish the radial symmetry of the optimizer in this inequality, you're finished, okay? So now fortunately, there was a result going back to 2016 by Jean Dolbeau, Maria and myself, namely that if two over P is greater equals this strange number here, right? Then the optimizers are given of that form. Now, if you replace in this A, the A by these numbers, you just do it diligently, right? And the B, etc. you learn out pops precisely this condition here with this lambda star, okay? This is precisely just that. And when you translate this V through all these change of variables which you've done, you end up with this function here, right? So this solves the problem. Of course, you, you, you have used a relatively deep theorem, right? This theorem here about the caffarelli cohn nienberg inequalities. But once you accept this, this result is about the um, Aron of Bohm problem is pretty straightforward. So again, for lambda less than lambda star, the result is sharp. This transition for symmetry to symmetry breaking is not sharp. We, don't, we know this now. Namely, you see, optimizing over the phase, this, 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 the, the, is that the phase depends on R and I've thrown away the derivatives in R, okay? In general, this was a lower bound, right? So the, the region where you actually have symmetry, which we proved symmetry is too small, it's actually bigger. And there are numerical, uh, evident, there's numerical evidence for that by Maria, that this actually is true. It sits that the critical lambda, where you have the transition between radial symmetry to non-symmetry, sits pretty much between lambda star and lambda bullet. But where this lambda actually is, we have no clue. Okay, so this is an open problem. Maybe have some interest. Okay. So this brings me now to the. To, I have to make some comments about this caffarelli cohn nirnberg inequalities because, after all, we used it, right? Uh, so this is a whole family of inequalities, right? It looks a little bit complicated. You have a parameter A, you have a parameter B. This C of D A, B is a sharp constant. And P of course has to be given because you would like to make the dimensions of both sides to be the same. So the P has to be chosen in this fashion, okay? So for, in my, in, for my purpose, this is always the sharp constant. Now, where are these inequalities valid? Well, when, when you're in three and higher dimension, the A is less or equals B, less or equals A plus one. It's, it's this strip. And when D is equals two, the A must be strictly less than B, strictly le less or equals A plus one, okay? So in fact, I've, I've, it, it's best to look at the picture, right? So, so the inequality is true in this closed strip up to the value d minus two over two. You notice in two dimension, this vertical line is actually on the b-axis. So the a better, better be negative, right? Okay. And so, so, so the inequality is true on this closed strip bounded by this uh, vertical line, but the optimizers only exist in the open strip. There are a few exceptions. For example, here, this point is where the Sobolev inequality is, right? In, in three and higher dimension, we know there are optimizers, right? Now, there's another curve here. This curve here, this curve is called, we call the, it the, the fairly Schneider curve. Can you see it? There's always this thing popping up, yeah. The fairly Schneider curve. So what is this curve? 
This is a curve which you can write down explicitly. Uh, I mean, it's not very enlightening, it's complicated, so that the graph is much better. And what does it mean? This curve says the following. When you're below this curve, in other words, when you're with your parameters down here, then the minimize is not radial. In other words, when you minimize over the radial class, you get a number which is strictly bigger when you minimize over the general class. However, and this is our theorem from 2016, when you are on and above the Fehle Schneider curve, the minimizers are radial and in fact, you can compute them. They are given by these functions here, a, one over a plus br to the two alpha, a and b are positive constants and n minus two over two, and the n is given by these numbers here, right? So it's not very enlightening, but for those who know a little bit about sharp sobolev inequalities, this is sort of a reminder, right? Okay. So now this is a hard theorem. And what I would like to do is, I would like to give you a little bit of a, an inkling on how to prove that, because I think at the basis of it is, is a very simple idea, namely the following. So let's talk with Sobolev, right? We all know and cherish it. And so you have the gradient of, of a function squared, your integrate of RD, that's greater or equal to a certain constant times the, the P norm to the power two over P. That's the Sobolev inequality. And the P cannot be anything because, in order, again, as before, in order to make the dimensions the same, you have to choose it in this fashion. By the way, I always find this amusing that when you invert this, you get the same formula, okay? Now, the sharp constant is known, S is given. I've displayed it here. That's not maybe so important. And there is equality if and only if, up to translations, the function is given by these uh, solutions here, by these functions here. Okay. Now this has been done by many people. I think Rodemich, uh, it's, it's not well known, but I learned this at some point that he already did this in 1966. Uh, I think it, but he never published it. It was some notes, lecture notes. Then it was Talenti in 76 and Obama in 75, sort of independently who figured out this, this whole result here. Okay, great. So now let's go and, and and make a connection. And the connection is you look at this fast diffusion flow. So d rho dt is equals Laplace and rho to the one minus one over d. Now you might think, my goodness, what's special about it? Well, it turns out this equation here, this PDE has self-similar solutions of bar and plot type. They are of the form c, c star t, that's just a normalization constant. You can choose the c star in any way you like plus x squared over t to the minus d. And now, of course, when you compare this with Sobolev, with the optimizer, it sort of dawns on you that there might be a connection, okay? And so what you do is you suggest that you, you change the dependent variable in the Sobolev inequality and you call a rho, the function f to the two d over d minus two. And then it's also convenient to introduce the pressure variable called p it's rho equals p to the minus d. And why do you do this? Because when p is self-similar, you see it's precisely of that form, okay? I mean, there are much deeper reasons for doing this. And these names, they all have uh, so, some meaning in physics, which was really explained very much, very clearly by Felix Otto, but let me not enter into this. I just use it now as a, as a trick, if you like. Okay, so now what do you do? Well, I mean, the, the, you, you can compute the altunum of the gradient in terms of these new variables, right? Okay, that's what the bottom line is. And, and you can then reformulate your Sobolev inequality in the following fashion, right? So integral rho grad p squared dx is greater or equals s prime. I call it s prime because there are some factors, right, which change the s. And then you have the integral rho dx to the d minus two over d. Now, just think formally, right? When you move the rho under the fast diffusion flow, formally, the right-hand side doesn't change. And so you might ask yourself, well, what happens with the left side? If you take the derivative of the left side, 
and you do a, a long computer integration by parts, you can actually work it out. So, do you still hear me? There was interruption. Hello. Uh, there was an interruption, right? Yeah. So, so let me go back. Yeah. So this is the. Did you, was this clear here? What I'm talking about? Until here, until here is fine. Okay, good. So this is the new Sobolev inequality, right? And the idea is now that you start moving the row under this fast diffusion flow, right? Okay. So the right hand side doesn't uh, change, right? Why? Because when you think of, you have a Laplacian here, I'm, I'm very formal, huh? okay? It doesn't change, but the left hand side, what you have to do is you take a derivative and now you do a computation. And when you do it, this computation is long and what it turns out is that you can write down this as the trace of the square of the traceless Hessian. That's this quantity here of P. So HP is the Hessian, right? Okay. And then you have this positive function here. This is clearly negative, right? Because you have a minus sign here. And you ask yourself, well, when is it zero? Well, when it's zero, it's a very simple computation. You realize immediately that the P wants to be a quadratic function. That's the only way how this thing can vanish, all right? So you see, you, you, you have in some sense now a chance of proving Sobolev using this fast diffusion flow. Now, unfortunately for the Sobolev inequality, it doesn't work. And the reason is because what you would like to do is you would like to apply it to stationary solutions, positive solutions. And a priori, you do not know anything about the smoothness of those. And all the elliptic regularity theorems, they, they fail. I mean, that's the, the limiting case, right? On, 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 on all the wonderful things we know. But for Caffarelli on Nirenberg, it works. You can use this. So the idea is very simple. You recast the problem as a Sobolev type inequality. When you do that, you get an inequality on SD minus one cross R plus, but the measure has changed to R to the N minus one, the R, the omega. Omega is the surface measure on the sphere. What is N? N is two P over P minus two. It's not an integer, all right? But nevertheless, you can go and do this computation, which you just indicated here, this one. It takes, it's enormous, right? What you see is you get really this thing to be negative. Moreover, in the caffarelli con nirnberg problem, you only have two places where you might have a problem. That's at zero and that's at infinity. And what you can do, you see everywhere else, it's beautifully regular. You have no singularities whatsoever. And what you do, and that takes an up a huge amount of work, is you, you can ish, deal with the regularity issues for the stationary solutions of the Euler-Lagrange equations. And that basically tells you that if you start out with a, a stationary solution, you take the variational derivative along the flow, it turns out to be negative. But since you cannot change to first order, it must be zero. And that allows you to figure out what the optimizer is. And so this works like a charm. It works very nicely, okay? But it's, 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 a, it's, the computations are enormous, right? Okay? So this is this caffarelli con nirnberg inequalities, yeah? And what I would like now to move is change the subject a little bit. Namely, it's, it's a problem which I, I came up many, many years ago and I had not the slightest clue how to deal with it until Rupert Frank got interested in it. And Rupert is, is so, so what I'm telling you now is work of Rupert with a little, a little bit of help of myself, right? So here it is. Let's look at zero modes of the three-dimensional Dirac equation. Huh? So this is this. I mean, so you have to think of the sigma one is the sigma matrix, sigma two is that matrix, and sigma three is this matrix. So this operator here, this equation, this operator is actually a matrix valued operator, right? I've, I sort of hope I did this right. You can write it out in this fashion, okay? That's what it is. And then you take a spinner of this type and you ask, well, do you have solutions of that equation? And uh, the, the solutions which you would like to have are solutions 
where the psi spinner is uh, square integrable and the magnetic field, which is curl of A, is in L2, right? Now, why do you need zero modes? Well, that, that's a, zero modes usually ent enter in a rather obstruction this way. So, so they enter, for example, in functional determinants in quantum electrodynamics in three dimensions. They enter as, as, as in, 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 the, in the stability of matter for magnetic fields that we actually, where we, we, we discovered this issue. So, so there are very good reasons to think about zero modes, right? And there are in fact examples and this we figured out with, Lo, with Yao, 1986. So that, I guess that shows that I'm a senior now, right? Uh, so long time ago, namely if you choose the Psi to be this spinner here. So this is a matrix, right? And you apply it to a constant spinner. And now you choose the A potential in this fashion here, one minus X squared omega plus two omega dot X, X plus two omega wedge X, this is the cross product. And the omega and the phi are connected in this fashion. Then indeed, Psi and A together satisfy this equation, right? Okay, good. Uh, there's an int a, a little bit of a funny story. I, I showed this example back in 1986 to Oliver Penrose. And Oliver Penrose, I, I did, you know, I had no clue what the Hopf operation was. I even didn't know the name. So, you know, working hard, you figured out somehow how the field lines looked. They were circles, they were nested on tori. It looked very interesting. And then I mentioned this to, to Oliver Penrose and says, ah, oh, that reminds him of twisters. And so I asked him what are twisters? And he said, well, he doesn't know, but that's something which his brother is doing. But then he wrote me a letter later, uh, two weeks later, where he explained beautifully that these field lines actually are nothing but the hop vibration, which you pull back from the three sphere under stereographic projection. So I learned the hop vibration from Oliver Penrose. So, so what can you do with that, all right? So here is a problem. Uh, I would like to know what kind of conditions do you need on the magnetic field so that you're sure that you have a zero mode or at least um, necessary, necessary condition, right? Okay, so, so, so what do you do, right? I mean, let's go back to, to um, uh, the Schrodinger case, right? You have minus Laplace and minus V, V is a positive potential which vanishes at infinity. Well, do you support a, a bound state? Well, what do you do? You, you take um, uh, integral grad F squared minus integral V F squared. You apply Hölder's inequality on the right hand side that gives you the three halves norm. And then you apply the Sobolev inequality here on the first term that gives you this term and you see right away a necessary condition for a bound state is that the V three halves norm, the, the three halves norm of V must be bigger than the Sobolev constant. Okay, so you say, well, let me do the same thing here, right? I look at this problem. This is the zero mode equation. Right? What you do is you simply square this operator and there is a sort of a miracle happening because the sigma matrices have strange commutation relations and they interact together with the A and the gradient in such a way to produce you the magnetic field. So, yeah, well, so here, this is a true equation. Then you holderize it, right? And now you'll realize that by the diamagnetic inequality, this is greater to equals the gradient of the modulus of psi. And what you can get is a necessary condition for a zero mode that this three halves norm of B is strictly bigger than S. Well, okay, fine. So that's kind of trivial. Well, here is a theorem. It turns out that a, a necessary condition is that the B three halves norm is greater or equals two S. Now you might say, well, you know, it's kind of uh, uh, boring, but there is an interesting point, namely the proof absolutely requires that the psi, we, we really have to use the spinner, uh, uh, the structure of this, that we talk about spinners, okay? So here's the theorem. Uh, yeah, why is, by the way, the three halves norm natural? Well, I hope this was clear from here. This is also the only reasonable norm on the potential which scales exactly like the gradient, 
right? So P3 halves is natural. So here's the result, right? If you have a, a, a necessary condition for to have a zero mode when B is in th L3 half is that B three halves number must be greater or equals twice the Sokolov constant. Okay, so again, uh, the diamagnetic inequality here is, is of course a well-known inequality. It's a wonderful inequality, has very interesting consequences. Here is one of them, but unfortunately it doesn't do any good, but we can improve. Here's the lemma. If you have a zero mode, so in other words, if you have a, a, a solution of that equation, I mean, these are just to, 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 to cover my, my butt, right? In the sense that I, I, I make a clear statement, a true statement. Then it turns out that the gradient of the modulus of psi squared is not just less than this expression, but you have a factor of two thirds in front. Okay, and you need the psi to be a zero mode. And this has to do with some algebraic, and I mean, this um, ideas, which go back to paper by David Calderbank, Paul Goduchon, and Mark Herzlich, and another paper by uh, Paul Fiehan. And I think uh, it might be interesting, I think I still have time, right? To give you a short idea how to prove that. Here it is. So what do you do? Well, you, you, you differentiate the modulus of psi, and as always, as you do with Sobolev function, you have to put here an epsilon squared and the square root in order to avoid the zeros of psi, right? Good. And then you see the first line is absolutely obvious, right? This is, this is just a derivative of psi because it's a square root, you do that. I mean, such, think of formal calculations, and because the A is real and I is imaginary, and here you're taking the real part, you can stick in this A, right? Good. So, so from this equation, you immediately gather the second line or the third line, I should say, namely that the modulus of grad modulus of psi is equals to the right hand side here. Okay. I mean, I just write it out. Okay. With dot problems, if you like. Okay. Good. Um, maybe I screwed up something. No, I didn't. This is good. All right. So now here comes the punch line. There is an operator, I call it pi. It acts on alpha is a vector in three dimensions and V is a spinner, okay? Now you look at this funny projection. Uh, well, a projection, it's not quite a projection. What does it do? The jth component is alpha J V, right? So you just multiply the spinner by alpha J. But then you subtract one third, the Pauli matrix sigma J multiplied by the matrix sigma alpha. This is a matrix applied to V, okay? Now you see, when you do that, you look at this gadget here at the bottom. Well, you see, since psi is a zero mode, I can for free add the right-hand side here with sigma dot grad minus I A psi for free. So I learn that this gradient here is nothing but, I, I can replace it with another gradient, but where I put this pi in front of it. Okay, so, well, then you remember that in this, when you have this structure here, this, this inner product between alpha tensor V and beta tensor W, here it's given. This is the, the, the inner product in spinners. This is the inner product, if you like, on the vector fields. Then you, you, you see that this pi is actually self-adjoint with respect to this inner product, and you can move it here. And then you do some Schwartz inequality, and then you get this pi, and pi of alpha tensor V squared is a simple computation you'll learn right away. That's two thirds the length of alpha squared times the norm of the spinner squared. And since the spinner is psi over psi epsilon and alpha is this vector, you'll re learn right away that this is just two thirds, okay? And this gives you the claimed inequality, right? So this is kind of interesting. So, so, so this gives you this, this, this wonderful diametric, diamagnetic inequality. And it's with that one way actually sort of proof this result, which I just mentioned at the beginning here of this section, namely this 2S. I mean, there are a bunch of other tricks which you can improve things, but that's the main idea. So, so one of the questions you can think is, ask, is this result optim optimal? 
And here's a strange thing. Take the Psi and just write this down. Just look at this Psi. I mean, it's crazy, right? And look at the vector potential A, which you notice, by the way, is a vector potential of a magnetic monopole. You can easily check purely formally that this Psi and this A satisfies this three-dimensional Dirac equation, okay? And provided, of course, that you choose the G equals one half, which is, by the way, precisely the condition that turns the magnetic monopole into a fiber bundle, but it's a different story. If you exit out, right, you compute the modulus, you, the gradient, and all this kind of stuff, you have equality here. So in a certain sense, this, this inequality here, which this with this two thirds is, is sharp, except I'm still a little confused because when you look at these expressions, none of these functions here are in any way integ also integrable here, right? So this is a very strange thing. And also the magnetic field is not, um, it's not really a magnetic field, it's a monopole, right? It's not divergence free. Okay, good. So this is the funny thing. Now, what else can you do? Well, here is a result which is maybe a little bit sharper. Think of the following spinner equation where the lambda is now a scalar function. So you have minus i sigma grad psi, psi is a spinner, equals three lambda x psi, okay? And you ask yourself, can you find necessary conditions on lambda so that you have a solution? Yeah, so the result is what you need in order, if you have a solution, then the three norm squared of lambda must be bigger than this number. And now you ask yourself, well, when do you have equality? Well, it turns out if you choose lambda of x equals one over one plus x, you have indeed equality, but with that lambda, you also have a spinner which satisfies this equation. This was precisely the one which Yao and I discovered, okay? And the proof of that theorem goes precisely in the same direction as we did, did before. You have to sort of change these arguments with this pi projection a little bit, but basically that's what it is, okay? So I think I'm out of time. So I thank you very much for your attention and that's it. Very much, Michael. Thanks for the beautiful talk. Do we have some questions? Uh, Michael, can you remind me a uh, statement for the uh, Heron of Bohm effect? Yes. Let me go back. <laughs> I can't remember it myself. <laughs> so it, it's this statement, right? So, so remember the functional? Here it is, right? This is the functional. And you ask yourself, what are the minimizers? And what then happens is that when you know that the lambda, remember the lambda is this, this factor in front of the L2 norm, when mm -hmm. this lambda is less than this number here on the right hand side, then the optimizers are given in this form up to constant scaling. Okay, so my remark, uh, okay, question is, slash remark is the following. So physically, a corona bomb effect was very unexpected, very surprising. Mathematically, it was not. Right, the right, right. Result, result of the uh, space not to be simply connected. Yes. Okay, so if you look at the general, say not simply connected so, or uh, uh, manifold, or let's say Riemann surface of, of higher genus. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. and, and take for magnetic potential, you take, um, uh, a flat connection. Mm -hmm. I think I see where you're going. Yeah, right. And that's an interesting problem, right? I mean, but I have to admit, I wouldn't know how to do it. I mean, I would have to think first, right? Right. You you look at the line bundles with a flat con uh, flat connection, and uh, similar similar variational problem. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. I, I, but, but of course, I would have to first <laughs> think about it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I understand that you cannot answer that's, it. That's an interesting question. Off that's the, top, interesting the top of your head, but yeah. Yeah. my question really was, did anybody think about this before? No, not, not, that, not that I know of. I mean, at least I didn't. 
And, and this problem here, uh, I was told, was also new. People okay. think about okay. it. Yeah. So that's that's a good news. That's a good news. You can see. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay. And my second second question, yeah. again related to the uh, Akhronov bomb, is that what about Akhronov bomb for Dirac uh, equation? Yeah. What is the question there? Okay. Is the question? So the question is uh, okay. So I have a Dirac operator again on. Uh, on a line bundle, a flat line bundle with a flat connection. Right? And I want to understand, say, zero most of this of this guy. Uh -huh. For example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, that's right. So, so we have recently a paper where we sort of determine all these zero modes for the two dimensional Dirac. But, you know, just um, completely elementary, really very much in R2, but not on the line bound. Okay. And even that on R2 seem that that seems to be new also. For 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 a coronal bomb potential. For a coronal bomb of the potential, right. Okay. You see, it turns out you can solve these things absolutely explicitly, right? And of course you can do other things with it. That's what we did in the recent paper with Maria and Jean, which we dedicate actually to Ari Labdev. Okay. Is awesome, right? that's, that's yeah. But but I mean for the line bond for general line bundles, I, I don't know. Yeah. So finally there is one statement kind of surprised me. Uh, you were saying that your minimizer for the with a with a magnetic field with a constant magnetic field was real at some point. Uh, but the constant magnetic was real, you no no the minimizer radial. was real. Radial, radial, right. Here. I, I thought you said real. No, radial. radial. Okay, okay. Then, then radial. okay. So I'm taking taking it back. So no, no, no. No, no. I mean in, in general it's not real, right? I mean yes, yeah, it, it cannot be real in general. Yeah. Okay, well, so. I'm not so sure. You see, I mean look, you, you could you could make the same argument here. It, it cannot be real, right? Yeah. Well, what is it? Okay. Okay, maybe that was my question. So if I look at the at Oh, because it's bomb corona, maybe it's a different. Yeah, yeah. Well, if I look at the Lagrange equation, for example. Look, 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 look. I mean, when you go back to this this thing, let's go back to this one, right? With the constant magnetic field. When you look at the at the, at the Landau problem, right? Yeah. The ground state, of course, is infinitely degenerate, but you have the Gaussian as a, as an, as 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 one of the of the functions in there. Right. You agree? Yes, which is positive and you know, extremely real, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now it could very well be because of the nonlinearity that you start pushing all the other guys out, away. You see what I'm trying to say? Okay. Right. That that because of this nonlinearity, it doesn't pay you to to, uh, to 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 really well. Let me put it this way: you will have a phase. So here's my conjecture. What does it mean to make a translation? You have to make a magnetic translation. You agree? Right, right, right. So you have a phase, but that's the only phase which you can get for this problem. That's my. So you 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 get a, a, a phase of that type at times a positive radial function. That would be my conjecture. Okay. And for small magnetic fields, it's true. Right. But it's perturbative, as I said. So we don't really know, you know, how 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 good such. I mean, you don't have any quantitative estimates. Okay. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much. It was very nice. Israel. Bye. Too many things, but this is still, uh, still beautiful. Good. Well, there's choice, right? Isn't that what the American way is? Well, that you are. That's right. That's exactly what overwhelms me usually. Right, right. It's, it's, like, it's like with the cereals when you go to the supermarket. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Good to see you, Israel. So, are there other questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Hello, Michael. Um, Hi. Um, it, back to the last part of your talk, there was this two thirds for, in the improvement of the diamagnetic inequality for yes. zero. Right. Right. Um, right. So let me let me try to find it. 
So my question is, is it possible to somehow make that a little bit quantitative to say that if you are close to being a zero mode, then you still can do better than the diamagnetic inequality? Um, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Very interesting question. I don't so know. I, actually, maybe even later, there's this when the pi comes in and you win the two thirds. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you see, it's, you see, in some sense, you, you would have to sort of work. Yeah. So, so this is the, 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 the term, right? I mean, of course, if you have a, an estimate on this one, uh, maybe. Yeah. It's a question of a gap. Right. Uh, well, yeah. And somehow there can't really be a gap, but, but yeah. it's, it tells <laughs> you right. that it must something, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So that's, that's an interesting point. Yeah, I haven't thought about it. Yeah. I was so wrapped up in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, these this things actually uh, have a, a fairly long history, right? I mean, this goes back actually the first one had some, some inkling about this kind of thing, used similar things, similar ideas was Stein. And then it was also used by uh, Yao. This, this are these Carter Yao inequalities. This are sort of improved um, uh, diamagnetic inequalities for uh, uh, gauge, field, the, gauge fields. ST Maybe, Yao. Uh, no, no, ST Yao. Yeah. Right. And, and so, 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 so maybe that's where one should look if you would like to understand a little bit deeper how one, whether one can improve things, right? So is there a geometric meaning to this pi that I just don't know or? Uh... Yeah, well, geometric meaning. It is a kind of a projection. And, and, and it's also related to what is called the Penrose projection. But I, I mean, I must say, I don't really have a, yeah, okay. So you see, so, so this last theorem, this one here, right? If, if, if you, you see, I didn't assume that the lambda was in any way positive or anything of that sort. But if you assume that the lambda is positive, you can actually turn this into a, um, um, a, a theorem. By the way, this, this theorem also holds in arbitrary dimension. You don't, you don't need three dimensions. So then what you can do, you can actually transform this into a theorem about the Dirac equation on manifolds and, and with, with, with conformal deformation, okay? And there is a wonderful inequality due to Hiyazi. And, if, and, and Rupert dug this up. And if you really apply this inequality extremely cleverly, you can actually recover the result. But of course, what you need is that the psi's are smooth and the lambda is smooth and positive. So there is a differential geometric interpretation on these kind of things, right? And the, 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 the pi there is, is then reveals itself as, 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 a, as a kind of a projection on, 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 on Clifford algebras. But you know, I like sort of the pedestrian way. I, I don't have a good feeling for these differential geometric notions. Thanks. So Hiyazi is sort of the, the, the person here who made the big progress on this differential in a differential geometric setting. Yeah. Thanks. Welcome. So I guess, are there more questions? Or we can thank the speaker again, and then if there's more questions, maybe we can ask offline. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much. Great seeing you.